Assalamu alaikum. Shukran for tuning in to this week's Anur the Light. A South African Muslim can be proud of the many leaders we have who shine a light on our religion through their selfless actions. Shanaz Gabru has given her heart and soul to the cause of young, vulnerable children and in return has enriched their lives. We spent today with her and got to learn more about the person and the work she does. There are few professions nobler than that of the social worker. For most, making a difference includes sporadic acts of kindness when required. But for others, like Shanaz Gabru, making a difference is daily dedication to the safeguarding, development and upliftment of those who cannot do for themselves. My first choice was not social, it was veterinary science. But back in the day, you had to go away to become a veterinary surgeon. <clears throat> but I, I liked the interaction, so I then decided that I wanted to do social work. I went for career guidance counselling and they said my next option was social work. And got into it and when we got to the, in our third year we do practicals and that's when you actually go into people's homes, you do the home visits and then you realise, you sit back and think, everybody's got a story to tell. Some people are really down and out and they don't have an extended family or a support network to listen to. And there you come, you know, uh, people... Revel when the social worker comes, you know, somebody to talk to. And that made me realize that I'm doing an important job. There's an important role for me to have in society. And it just grew from strength to strength from there. When, when I married into the family, I realized that they have a lot of, um, you know, love and uh, what you care for, underprivileged children, for animals. A um, very humble, very unique family. And uh, the thing that uh, inspired me a lot is that uh, Sh Sh Shanaz was married before they couldn't have any kids and they adopted two orphan kids and that really, really touched me. Shanaz is a senior manager and acting director of Child Welfare Durban and District, a role she has played for the past six years. Her duties include coordinating staff development and training programs, drafting annual reports required by the Department of Social Development and Fundraising. I've been a social worker for almost 20 years and um, I started off with disabilities. I have to say I started off with disabilities. I was a provincial director for disabilities and that was straight out of university. And at that time I thought disabilities was the all and be end all. And then I adopted my son and I had to leave work. And I then realized that the childcare field seemed quite, being a mother then, the childcare field seemed quite attractive. And I started off at a children's home, as a manager at a children's home. And when you see the kind of children that come into the facilities, the abused, the abandoned, the neglected, the ones that have no voice, you know, you realize that I need to be an ambassador for them, I need to do something for them. And that is when I became very proactive in my social work. When you see a child that's been repeatedly abused, uh, scars on their body and they still look at you with so much of trust and love and you think you have to be there to do something for these children. The stories are very, very sad, the things that we come across, but but being able to have the, the, uh, the, um, the offender prosecuted for something like that and to set an example for child care and child protection is what makes me go on now. She also oversees the management of four child and youth care centres, including the William Clark Otandweni Child and Youth Care Centre, the Edith Benson Child and Youth Care Centre and the Lake Haven Zamani Child and Youth Care Centre. Her key function at Child Welfare Durban and District is to ensure that all the policies and procedures of these youth care centres are adhered to, ensuring effective service is delivered to the often vulnerable young people these to serve. We have three child and youth care centres. One is a baby's home. One caters for children between 6 and 18. And then we have, uh, well, two actually cater for children between 6 and 18. And the third one is a home for 
boys who previously lived on the street, so a street for, uh, home for ex-street kids. So any child that comes into these facilities has got to be found to be a child in need of care. That means social worker, we have in Child Welfare Devon District, we have our community services, leg of services, which if somebody calls and says, here's a child that's being abused, they will go and investigate. If you find that the child is being repeatedly abused, the child needs to be removed to a safe environment, they go to the children's court where the commissioner of child welfare determines that the child needs to come into the home. So my job then is to manage the three managers of the three child and youth care centres to ensure that the children have proper well meals, clothing, education, uh, that their spiritual needs are attended to in all aspects of their life. It's, it's like you would care for a child in their own environment. And of course, at the same time that this is happening, we try to reunify the child back to a family member, extended or otherwise, related or unrelated, or put the child up for adoption if you realise that the, the route to the family is not worth exploring, that the child will still be a child in need of care if we remove them back to their families. This is a woman who puts practice to what she preaches. Her children, Yusuf and Zara, are both adopted and she considers herself truly blessed. For whatever reasons, we're unable to have our own children and um, when my son was adopted, at the, when, when the Mufti had come to do the adhan in his ear, the Mufti said to me that, do you know when this child's rule was created, Allah has already determined that he was going to come to your home, that you were going to be his mum. And that for me has, you know, has impacted. I mean, my children are like my very own. My daughter was, I adopted her from the Edith Benson baby's home. So, you know, I believe that she, she was there for a reason and I was there for a reason at the stage and, and we met in that way. And being a child welfare also, you know, we have so many children that are child and youth care centers that are needing families. So my role, I believe that Allah has placed me here in child welfare because I'm able to persuade people to, to go the adoption way. So just my story to these parents is very motivation and inspiration to them as well. She's, she's got a fantastic heart, a very giving heart, strong personality in the sense that uh, she can work with any type of people. Uh, she doesn't really bring problems home. She doesn't accept defeat. She never accepts defeat. She will always come through and wherever, whatever it is, whether it's regarding kids or families that are underprivileged or regarding home matters, she doesn't give up. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, there are many doors to goodness. Enjoining good, forbidding evil, removing harm from the road, guiding one to the object of his needs, hurrying with the strength of one's legs to one in sorrow who is asking for help, and supporting the weak with the strength of one's arms. Shinaz is living proof of this. <laughs> In Cape Town, a huge controversy has broken out around the call to prayer. Tempers are heated, but this calls for cool heads, and we went to find out what exactly is going on. The Adhan, the Muslim call to prayer. It is sounded five times a day from mosques as a reminder to the faithful to fulfill their prayers. Everywhere Muslims find themselves, this call to prayer can be heard. I'm firstly going to say to Muslims, um, respect the Adhan. Respect the call to prayer. Because that is one particular area where we as Muslims also have to up our levels in terms of the respect for the other. And I'm going to touch on that for one minute. Um, in this very area of District 6, where we had a diversity of, of communities and religious people, when anybody of a non-Muslim faith would walk past a mosque and the call to prayer, the Adhan is being sounded, they would actually stand still and listen until it's completed and then they would carry on walking. That's the first thing I would like to say to Muslims, is respect the Adhan and respond to the Adhan as our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, wanted us to respond to it with respect and to repeat the words of the Adhan to make yourself conscious of what is being said. During the holy month of Ramadan, the city of Cape Town received a complaint from a resident living adjacent to the mosque in District 6. Under the mandate of the city, 
the complaint had to be investigated. What the regulations and the Act allows is for any resident, anyone in any community, to lodge a complaint in whichever form. You may choose to engage the noise control uh, unit within a specific city, uh, which then pushes you into one process, or you may choose, in the case of the Mew Street Mosque, to lodge an affidavit via the South African Police Service. And when you lodge an affidavit via the police service, you make a suggestion as a resident that the noise, in this case used in the legal sense, uh, is in the legal sense again a noise disturbance. Soon after, social media picked up on this complaint and heated debates followed. A call for a petition was made in support of the call to prayer and received over 100,000 signatures. We had the support of people not just locally around the mosque, the support that we had or we have is actually globally. We had people from as far as Norway um, sending us messages to say that we support the call to prayer and that it must never stop. Uh, and for that reason, we went on an electronic campaign. First of all, we have over 100,000 signatories on the electronic campaign. Then we also have the physical one where people came and signed a petition right here at the mosque and at other, other venues as well. And that, that campaign is still running, that petition, and people are still signing it. A charge was laid under the city's bylaws, which in turn are governed by the province, who in turn are governed by national legislation. The mosque committee felt the call to prayer cannot be labelled as noise and have said this to elected officials. We met on the 11th of June, we met with them. Uh, the meeting was very brief. We heard what they wanted to say and what they have put on the table for us. And the good news was that we are under the required decibels that uh, regards the, the adhan or the call to prayer as a disturbance. And that was the good news for us. And so we met with the mosque. We shared with them what, in my view, was a very was the very positive news that it wasn't a noise disturbance because you're in actual fact under seven decibels. Which we then explained the the following process and explained to them the fact that. Now that you're not classified as a noise disturbance, unfortunately the law doesn't allow for us to say, okay, the problem has gone away, the instruction according to the law is now you're a noise nuisance, now you've got to manage it. Religious organizations across the board are supporting the mosque's assertion that the sound emanating from these spaces cannot be deemed noise. The city in turn says they cannot change this legislation as it is a national issue and should be challenged there. People who had never been together are now being drawn together by economic necessity and of economic choice. And the rebuilding of community, we talk about social uh, cohesion. These are the moments of social cohesion and that's why I'm saying it's always premised on the question, why do they do that? How long have they been doing? What, what, what does it affect on them, wherever they may be, the other might be? And whoever the other might be, let me then share with them as one who is unfamiliar with the atan or the church bell or whatever I find as a discordant uh, invasion in my life for the day. Let's talk about that. But we, you, 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 you have a position, but then you, you move towards establishing what authorizes your position. If we are serious about um, respecting, promoting tolerance, community cohesion, bringing more people into an understanding that we are better as a result of our diversity, on a provincial level, we've got to review the processes, but very importantly, national, because that Environment Conservation Act has been amended a number of times, but interestingly, it's only the noise component that hasn't changed at all. So national government also has an opportunity here to bring in line an act that can really promote uh, an understanding, cohesion, tolerance, integration, because ultimately the act needs to change for anything else to change. But we are trying in the city of Cape Town. We hope and pray that um, whatever has been put on the table in terms of the bylaw and, and removing this from, from the nuisance and, and disturbance category, uh, we will support it and we'll give them our 100% support because that is what we are after really.
The mosque is situated in an area where people were forcibly removed through the Group Areas Act during apartheid. The call to prayer has sounded from this particular place for over 100 years, and its sound as well as role in the city's history is best summed up through a poem by C. Louis Leipold. Nog voor die skari van die skemerdal, oor stad en dorp en berg en bosrijk kloof, nog eer die middag van sy glans beroof, met laaste kleur die minaret bestraal, klink dier die lucht die aanroep van Bilal, die aandgebed beleidnis van geloof, waar die swak twyfel van die siel verdoof, met die hartstochtelik kracht van sy koraal. God is groot, God is groot, Getuig daar is geen ander God as God. Getuig Mammoet is die profeet van God. Kom in tot gebed, kom in tot redding. God is groot. Daar is geen ander God as God. Geen sluimer val op hom wat nimmer slaap. Vertrou jou siel, jy wat er rustig gaan, aan hom wat altyd wakend oor jou waak, die laaste sonstraal van die bergkruin skraap. Sterf weg, sterf weg, die bondgekleede gloed verslaan en skemer stort oor stad en dorp en braak. Islam preaches tolerance and I pray that there is an amicable solution that takes into account both sides. The Free State is a province that we don't often get to visit, but its natural beauty is set to rival some of the better known places around South Africa. We journeyed there to show you what you can get up to. The Free State is most definitely one of those undiscovered places as many people just whiz through the province on their way elsewhere. But if you stop for a moment and take in the view, you'll soon realize that this is a place of breathtaking beauty. At the foot of a mountain stands Tempelhof Game Farm, where visitors can interact with a variety of wild animals. The drive to the game farm and the views across the valley to the Maluti Mountains will leave one feeling content as the vistas lay bare the absolute grandeur of the scene. Templehof Farm was also the very first farm in South Africa that instituted green practices way back in 1952. <laughs> En uh, toe ons die plaas koop, toe begin my vrou die geschiedenis opvolg. En toe ons die geschiedenis opvolg, dit is die eerste plaas in Zuid-Afrika, wat daar uh, na die uh, grondbewaring toegepas is. En toe het hom nou genoem die groen plaas. Omdat ons so lekker gasvry is, ons makkelijke mens, ons praat met allemaal en ons geniet allemaal en ons vat allemaal uit na plekjes toe wat mooi is op die plaas. En dit is net lekker om met mense te werk. Ons is mense mense. One of the most popular interactions is the feeding of the lion cubs and visitors can participate in this or just take a walk with them. Conservation is very important on this farm and there's constantly new ways being implemented in making sure the animals are well cared for. Leaving this place of tranquility will be difficult, but there's a whole lot more to discover in this most beautiful of provinces. Chocolate is one of those delicacies that are known to make any day better. The saying local is lekker is quite apt for the delicious handcrafted chocolates made in Clarence in the Free State. Kenny Chocolates is a brand that we started in 2010 after I came back from a trip to Alaska. Um, it's about creating really good chocolate using some of the best products in the world. It's about sourcing our products. Um, very important for us to source the best. We put passion and soul in our chocolates. We have been to trade shows all over the world. We can hold our own. We, we use quality ingredients. Our designs are world class. And uh, we, we love what we do. It's our passion. 
Kaylin Thomas can be described as a master chocolatier whose craft has been perfected over many years. One look at these beautifully handmade chocolates and all resistance crumbles in an instant. We uh, create a range of ganaches, which is basically dark chocolate and cream. And those, those ganaches all have a different flavor that we infuse in and they all have a different pattern. The pattern that we put on top is, is actually made from the cocoa bean, from cocoa butter. And then we also have a range of um, uh, toffaluxes, which have a, a very thin layer of um, toffee in the bottom. So it, you have a, a merging of the flavors. And then um, we do also the traditional fudge and the, the, the Turkish style nougat. and. Uh, we have a pretty wide range of products. The store in Clarence is well stocked with a variety of chocolates to choose from. There's also the option of ordering online, but be sure to take your time enjoying it, as they tend to go up far too quickly. The Free State is well known as the place where some of the best sandstone buildings can be found in South Africa. One of the finest examples is the old gum tree mill which is claimed to be the tallest such structure still around. At one stage, the mill was a hub of activity as farmers brought their maize to be ground and freighted it to places all across the country. Well, seemingly, it is the tallest building, sandstone building in South Africa. Uh, you know, this is hearsay, but it, it goes by that fame. And it ran for a long time. You know, 50, uh, 50 years at least, 40 under the South African Milling Company, but then I would say 10 uh, under Skitters Dry Milling Company. Um, and, and so it had quite a long history. N you know, not many of them have lasted that long. Apart from the mill, there was also a small village with a train station and post office. The train station became a place of great joy and sorrow as young and old departed or arrived from the area. It, uh, it, it did develop a community, quite an active, a small community, but it was quite an active one, thanks largely to the railway line, which was the Bloemfontein line, which ultimately went on to Durban. It was the Cape Town Durban line. It, it was expanded. Every few years they worked on it and it slowly expanded from Bloemfontein and reached here in about 1907, 1908. And that's when Charles Stevens realized he now had the transport uh, to get his products. Today, the village lies derelict, but there are plans to save the buildings and even restore it to its former glory. It will take a lot of money to do this, but the history of the place and its impact cannot be denied. Visitors who enjoy history and architecture will delight in the shadow of the old gum tree mill and village. Wow, there are so many more places to discover in this beautiful land of ours. I don't know about you, but my notebook on things to see and do, as well as places to eat, is filling up quite fast. Alhamdulillah, we've reached the end of this week's episode. Please do tune in next week, same time, same place. Kinda mare mukwanda, kiri aribu eri bonanen hape. Assalamu alaikum.